Okay, so let's talk, let's talk about lipid mobility. So there's two types. There's lateral diffusion and transverse diffusion. So uh, lateral diffusion is when this phos one phospholipid is just moving laterally across the membrane, right? Self-explanatory. And so this is very favorable, energetically favorable, because it's very fast. And you might ask, well, why, why is it so fast? And it's because, well, it has it's lower energy, right? And the reason is that this polar head group doesn't have to cross the hydrophobic region. So it's only staying in this like hydrophilic region. It likes to, it just wants to stay there, right? It's just moving laterally down. So that's why this is a lower energy, energetically favorable diffusion. Then you have transverse diffusion. So transverse diffusion is a, is a little bit slower and this involves one phospholipid literally flipping to the other side. And so why is this slow? And it's because this polar head group, again, it, it's polar, it has to cross this non-polar region to get to the other side. And so that's why it's energetically unfavorable. Okay? Right. So those are the two types of diffusion. So now we can talk about uh, membrane proteins. So there's three types. Uh, the first one is integral intrinsic membrane P protein. And uh, here you can see it kind of drawn in orange here. So these portions right here, they can either span the entire membrane, right? Or they can just span like a tiny portion of it. So it doesn't have to be the whole thing. It can be like maybe half or something like that. So what are these regions going to be? These two regions right here, do you think they're going to be hydrophilic or hydrophobic? So they're going to be hydrophilic, right? Because this is the uh, outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. And then this region right here is going to be hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Well, it's going to be it's going to be hydrophobic, right? All right, hydrophobic, yeah. Because this is like the you know where all the fatty acids are that are hydrophobic. That's so that's all integral intrinsic membrane proteins are. And um, then you have peripheral extrinsic membrane proteins. And so what are these? These are so can associate with either the polar head group, so polar. Uh, polar group or uh, in the intrinsic group, like the, the, this part of the intrinsic group, right? So they're going to be kind of hydrophilic uh, on this on this region right here. H-philic, right? And then the last one uh, is a transmembrane protein. And so transmembrane proteins uh, can have either alpha helices or beta sheets across the membrane. And then we're going to go into a little bit of a calculation in the next part with transmembrane proteins. All right, so really quick discussion of uh, transmembrane proteins. Uh, we're going to do a calculation that he went over in class, which might be important. So this is a bilayer membrane. So we have the head group, which takes is, a, is about 15 angstroms across. Uh, we have the each hydrophobic uh, the, the fatty acid tail. That is. Uh, each one is 15 uh, angstroms, so that together that's 30 across. And then same here, this head group is also 15 angstroms. So uh, let's say, uh, so remember transmembrane proteins can either be alpha helices or beta sheets spanning the membrane. So let's look at an example uh, if, the, if it's made out of uh, alpha helices. So, so we know that this region right here, uh, this is you know spanning the membrane, that's 30 angstroms, right? From uh, like the, the length of both the tails, right? So we can do a quick calculation to find out how many uh, amino acids uh, can, can go across, right? So uh, we know that one turn rises 5.4 angstroms, okay? So we can do 30 angstroms times one turn per 5.4 angstroms gives you, uh, it is 5.56 turns. So 5.5 six, like five, 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 six turns across the membrane, okay? And so then we also previously learned that there are 3.6 residues per turn. So 5.556 turns, and there's 3.6 residues uh, per turn. And so then you could find the number of residues that are going across the membrane, right? With some, some stoichiometry. So that comes up to about 20. So 20 amino acid residues can span the membrane uh, for a, a transmembrane protein made out of alpha helices. So we have uh, what's called hydropathy plots. And so they sound, they sound kind of complicated, but uh, let's break this down. So uh, basically, uh, I don't know if you can read this, but this says 
the purpose of a hydropathy plot is to predict whether the portion of the protein can be a membrane-spanning sequence or not. Okay, that's all it tells us. And uh, it can accomplish this by using uh, what's called sliding windows, right? And so for an amino app, for, for the portion of a protein to be able to go across the membrane, that means all the residues have to be hydrophobic. They have to be nonpolar, right? So uh, we can use this sliding window to kind of tell us if you know, we're gonna have a section, a chunk of amino acids that are gonna be nonpolar, right? That are gonna be hydrophobic. So uh, the sliding window is the average hydropathy value over a set window of uh, amino acid residues. So let's say, for example, uh, in class we used, it was seven amino acids, right? So let's do, let's do a quick example, how we would go about finding uh, the hydropathy value for some amino acids in a sequence. So uh, let's say we have to find the hydropathy value for the first amino acid in a sequence, and let's say the sliding, the sliding window is seven amino acids. Okay, so let's, what's the first step? The first step is you consider the hydrophobicity of the first seven amino acids, right? So you start with one because you're trying to find the hydropathy value for this first one, and then you know the sliding window is seven amino acids. So you go from one to seven, you look at those seven uh, hydrophobicity values, you average them, and that gives you the hydropathy value for the first amino acid, okay? So far, so good. Um, then we can consider the hydrophobicity of uh, the, second, uh, the second through eighth amino acid. So if we're trying to find the hydropathy value for the second amino acid in the sequence, then we shift this sliding window up one, right? So then it's going, it's still seven amino acids, so it's, now it's going from two to eight. So you're finding the hydrophobicity values for amino acids two through eight, you're averaging them, and then that's giving you the hydropathy value for the second amino acid, okay? So you kind of, you get the idea now that we're like, we're finding hydropathy values for each amino acid by shifting the sliding window further and further down, and we're getting you know values for the first one, the second one, third one, so on, until we can create a plot. So this beautiful plot right here is that's the hydropathy plot. So this y-axis, the y-axis is free energy, that, that, that's uh, kilojoules per mole um, in class, that was the example. And this uh, is zero, it's, the top is plus 200, minus 200. Uh, the x-axis is the first amino acid in the 20 uh, res residue segments. So uh, you can see here that you have uh, th this plot right here, and then you have this value, which was in class, uh, it was 85 kilojoules per mole. And uh, then you have this region that's above that, and so this is going to be hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. And so this is telling us that you have a large number, a large chunk of amino acids uh, that are right next to each other, and all of them are hydrophobic, which means that it's most likely going across the membrane. It's most likely uh, the transmembrane portion of the protein. So that's what this, this uh, part above that graph is telling you. And then you can also do, this is like another way to construct the hydropathy plot. And so the, the y-axis is the hydropathy index. The x-axis is the residue number. And uh, this also tells you the same thing. It's just written in a slightly different way. Um, this region also is gonna be hydrophobic, right? And that's most likely gonna be the region that's spanning the membrane because all the amino acids that are in this like orange colored section are all hydrophobic. They're all hydrophobic, so they're all right next to each other, and uh, that is why, uh, so everything above the zero on the hydropathy index is hydrophobic, everything below zero is hydrophilic. And so you have this big chunk right here, and that is um, all hydrophobic. And so now we're gonna go over an example of uh, a hydropathy plot of bacteriorhodopsin. Let's talk about uh, bacteriorhodopsin and like its hydropathy plot. So, uh, this is the hydropathy index, the residue number, and uh, this is telling us, so that we know that the structure is uh, seven transmembrane alpha helices, and we can uh, kind of predict that from this hydropathy index. So uh, there's seven distinct regions that are, remember everything above here is hydrophobic, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hydrophobic regions, so that's uh, where all the amino acids that are right next to each other are hydrophobic, so that means it's most likely going across the membrane uh, you know, across the membrane, which is hydrophobic. And so each spike, this is a little bit of review, so each spike on this graph has how many amino acid residues? So each spike corresponds to 
one alpha helix, right? So how many uh, uh, amino acids can be in one alpha helix going across the membrane? And we did that calculation, and that's 20. About, it's, about, it's about 20. It's 20. Um, and then, so all this talk about uh, membrane-spanning proteins made of alpha helices uh, makes you think, well, can also can beta sheets do the same? And the answer is, well, yes, uh, but it's a little, it's a, it's a little bit simpler than, the, than that, uh, than alpha helices. So you need a minimum of eight uh, beta sheets to make what's called a beta barrel, right? So a beta barrel uh, can go across the membrane because a beta sheet, one beta sheet is uh, too short. It cannot go across the membrane. Uh, so you need to have a bunch of them uh, grouped together. And one uh, important question this raises is, well, what is a hydropathy, Will a hydropathy plot of a, of, a, of a beta barrel tell you anything? And the answer is no, because every other amino acid residue is going to be hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Like there's not going to be a sequence of amino of consecutive amino acids that are hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Or like yeah, it, it, that that all that is the only thing that a hydropathy index can tell you. And uh, since that's not the case for a beta barrel, there's no you know consecutive sequence. It's kind of useless. So a hydropathy index. Just is uh, is not going to work for beta barrel proteins. Uh, okay, uh, so now let's talk about let's talk about membranes. So we know membranes are selectively permeable, and uh, diffusion depends on uh, hydrophobicity, hydrophobicity, and size. Okay, so let's go through let's go through three examples. So you have what's called the, the small hydrophobic. Uh, Molecules, and so that's going to be oxygen and carbon dioxide, and these diffuse freely without a transporter, only along the concentration gradient. Sorry, concentration gradient, and this is the driving force for that, that that like easy diffusion. Okay, only along the concentration gradient do these small hydrophobic molecules easily diffuse. Then we have polar charge molecules, and these diffuse slowly. And so, for example, water is you know slow to diffuse across the membrane, but uh, there's these channels called aquaporins, which we'll talk about in a bit uh, in more way more detail. Uh, these aquaporin channels can help uh, water diffuse across a membrane. And then, last uh, and certainly least, are small ions, and these are you know potassium chloride, hydrogen ions. They are very low permeability to the membrane because. Well, they're small, but the thing is they're charged, right? And so charged, mo charge, like, charged molecules are not, are really gonna hate that hydrophobic, uh, you know, region of the, of the membrane. So they're, they're really, they can't really get across the membrane unless they have like some kind of channel and those channels like potassium, uh, sodium potassium pumps, uh, we're gonna talk about in a bit, those really help with these ions diffusing. So this might be a little tough to see, just uh, kind of bear with me. Um, so, the, we're going to talk about the thermodynamics of membrane transport. So there's two main contributions. Uh, the first one is electric potential across the membrane. And so that is generated by having uh, a charge imbalance across the membrane. And then uh, let's say you have a charged molecule being transported. You have to take into consideration the effect of the electric field. But uh, if you have an uncharged molecule, uh, being transported, then there's no electric field effect because it's it's not charged. It cannot respond to the electric field. Um, and then you have uh, the second one. The second co contribution to thermodynamics is the concentration gradient, and this is created by having a different concentration of ions uh, outside and inside the cell. Uh, and then there is this uh, beautiful equation, a uh, very long equation that relates both of these uh, contributions. And so this will give you the delta G. Uh, import of you know whatever molecule you're trying to transport, and we'll go over an example, uh, a conceptual example right here, and then uh, an example with actual values uh, in in the next part. So this whole equation. So let's break this down. So you have RT natural log concentration inside versus concentration outside. So this is for importing a molecule into the cell. So the R value is 8.3145 joules per mole kelvin. It might be difficult to see. And then this T is temperature in Kelvin. You have the natural log, and then the concentration of ions inside the cell versus outside, and this is only if you are importing. And then you have plus this ZF, and then uh, voltage inside and voltage outside. So this Z value uh, can be 
uh, positive or negative depending on like the charge of the ion. So if you have a sodium ion, uh, that's going to be Z is going to be plus one. So that's then it's positive. But if you have a chloride ion, it's going to be minus one. So you're going to plug minus one in for Z. And that's the same thing, you know, if you have calcium, it's going to be two plus. So then you put two plus and, you know, so on. And then you have this Faraday's, what's called Faraday's constant. And this is uh, 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. And then you have uh, the voltage inside minus the voltage outside of the cell. And so let's go, let's go over a quick example of uh, just, you know, let's kind of think about this and let's figure out how we would go about uh, setting up an equation if we were considering like doing, in, like importing a molecule. So you're importing a molecule uh, from, this should be from inside the cell uh, to, oh, that should say, oh my God, this should actually say, Outside to inside. Okay, that's important. Okay, so outside the cell, you're going to consider is your starting point, and then inside the cell is the designation point. Okay, so keep that in mind. So the rule of thumb, you're always going to have uh, the designation point on the top. So that's going to be the concentration inside the cell, and so that's what this equation here is saying for importing a molecule, and then O divided by the concentration of the starting point. And the starting point in this case is where the molecule started from. It started from outside the cell, so that's gonna be the concentration outside. And that's where you can see that right there. And so, yeah, the designation point is where the molecule just ends up. So just keep that in mind. So, uh, and then another thing, uh, so now let's talk about for voltages, right? So always, 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 the designation voltage, right? The designation voltage in this case is where it ends up. So that's gonna be the voltage inside the cell. We'll write, we'll just write that. So V inside uh, minus the starting point voltage. And the starting point voltage in this case, if you're importing, is gonna be the voltage outside the cell. So minus V outside. And so that's also where you can see this inside minus outside, and that's for importing, uh, importing a molecule into the cell. So let's go over an example now uh, with the actual numerical values using this equation. Again, this is might be kind of hard to see, so I'll read these values out. So we're gonna just do a calculation with this, you know, this big ass equation right here uh, of importing, so this says calculate ch uh, delta G importing uh, sodium into a cell. So we're going from out sodium outside the cells, imported into the cell. Uh, so it, get, it gives you the concentration of sodium outside the cell, it's 150 millimolar. Concentration of sodium inside is 10 millimolar. Uh, it gives you the temperatures, 20 degrees Celsius. The um, membrane potential is negative 50 millivolts and that's inside the cell is negative, okay? So, uh, so you start with the equation right here, so just rewrote it, um, delta G importing. So, you know, we're importing from outside to inside, so this equation will, will work. So we have uh, the value R, so that's gonna be uh, 8.3145 uh, joules, joules per mole Kelvin, right? Uh, times T, so keep in mind T uh, is, has to be in Kelvin, right? So uh, the, you add uh, Celsius plus uh, 273 and you get 293 Kelvin. So we'll put 293K. And then you have the concentration inside the cell of sodium uh, versus concentration outside. And so this is we're importing, so this, con this, uh, this uh, equation will work. So inside the cell, the sodium is 10 millimolar, so that is going to be 0. Uh, 0 0.01 molar. So we can write that as natural log of 0 0.01 molar. And then the concentration of sodium outside the cell uh, was told, we were, we were told 150 millimolar. So that's going to be uh, 0 0.15 molar. 0 0.15 molar plus Z. So remember Z is the charge. So sodium is plus one. So Z is just going to be plus one. So we'll just write plus one times F, which is we know is 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. And then you have uh, the voltage inside the cell minus outside the cell. And so we know that uh, relative to the outside of the cell, so the inside of the cell is negative 50, uh, and so inside the cell is negative. So we can kind of uh, assume that outside the cell, 
it's going to be zero, uh, and then inside the cell it's negative 50. So inside the cell we'll put negative 50 uh, millivolts or negative uh, 0.05 volts. We had to convert that to volts. So my bad, negative 0.05 volts minus uh, zero volts outside because it's relative to the outside of the cell, it's negative 50 millivolts. Uh, and then you just, uh, you have every value plugged in so you can just calculate it and just keep in mind the units. So the units are, are kind of important. So you end up getting an answer that is in joules per mole. And uh, that's gonna be, you get around after you know plugging this in, negative 11,400 uh, 21 joules per mole and then you can convert that to kilojoules by dividing by a thousand and then you can get negative 11.6 or like negative 11.4 something like that uh, kilojoules per mole and that is how you can find the delta G of sodium of importing sodium into a cell with this big ass equation okay Okay, so modes of membrane uh, transport. So we have two different classifications. So we'll start with simple diffusion. And so this is uh, small hydrophobic uncharged uh, molecules. So we already talked about that was oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide. And uh, then uh, there's not really any help that is needed. It just goes down the concentration gradient. That's the driving force. And then you have what's called facilitated transport. So, uh, facilitated transport, you do need the help of a channel or a carrier. So we'll write channel uh, or a carrier, okay? So that's, you do need, it's, you know, those are, that's what's facilitating the transport, easy way to remember that. And then there's two types of facilitated transport. Uh, so there's, a, a pa there's passive transport and active transport. So passive transport is uh, just moving down the concentration gradient through a pore, channel uh, or transporter and so that's like kind of you know sodium and potassium they you know can't do simple diffusion because they're you know they're small but they're charged right they can't they can't you know just simply diffuse so then they use the help of you know sodium potassium pumps or channels um, and those can you know passively diffuse down their concentration gradients and then there's uh, active transport so that's going against the concentration gradient so anytime I write here it's a uh, gradient and then in the brackets it's concentration gradient uh, just an easier way that I write it uh, so you're going against the concentration gradient with uh, the help of an active carrier and this uses energy so yeah it costs energy uh, and yeah so then let's look at let's look at a free energy diagram of a simple versus facilitated uh, transport. So simple diffusion versus facilitated transport. So we have uh, delta G on this axis right here and then we just have so um, the, the molecule starting off on the outside and this is kind of the membrane here, these two lines dividing and then going into the inside of the cell. So if we look at this, uh, this brown line right here, this top line, that's, that's, showing, that's showing simple diffusion without a transporter. So this has a very high um, delta that has a very high activation energy, okay? And so now let's compare that to uh, an orange right here. This is the a facilitated transport, and this is using, you know, a molecule is using a transporter to get across the membrane. And so you have a much less delta G, you have multi, much less uh, uh, activation energy uh, that, to get across this, uh, this membrane. And so that's what a facilitated transporter uh, can, can, do, can do for you. And so now let's really quickly just go over some transporter classes. Uh, just, this is some very simple terminology. So transport, uh, transporters can be classified by ligand. Where is the orange marker? Ligand. And directionality. Ligand and directionality, and so there's there's three types. So there's what's called um, uniport, and that's moving uh, one substrate uh, at a time in just one direction, right? And then you have what's called a symport, and this is moving two different substrates in the same direction. So you can see in this, they're you know going in the same direction into the cell. Uh, then you have an antiport, 
and that's self-explanatory. That's just two different substrates being moved. Uh, one is going uh, in the uh, opposite direction as the other, and uh, that's that's all the classification. So next up, we'll talk more in detail about passive transport. We're going to talk about passive transport. So uh, this says channels uh, in parentheses pores uh, are open at both sides of the membrane, and they can be uh, selective uh, and regulated too for different uh, molecules, right? And so uh, one example is uh, bacterial porin, right? So it's 16 uh, beta strands, and uh, they're usually open like all the time, and you know makes a, a beta barrel. And then uh, it's selected for small ions and water. Okay. So uh, how it works is since it's passive transport, that means that a concentration gradient has to be involved. So uh, the molecules, you know, these ions and water will diffuse along the concentration gradient. And uh, an interesting concept is uh, if you can create a larger concentration gradient, then you're going to have a higher transport speed. Okay, so that just that correlates directly. So greater concentration gradient, the quicker the molecules will uh, be passively transported. Uh, and then this is just kind of like what it looks like. This is a bacterial porin. These are like um, this is like where the, the the hole where like the ions will diffuse through that, that creates the channel. Uh, so yeah. So now let's talk about aquaporin selectivity. This is probably my favorite one uh, because this is like this is. This is basically just a, a catfish. That's all this molecule is. So you'll understand why in a second. So this is highly selective for water. Okay. So that means no potassium, not even even hydrogen ions, like very tiny hydrogen ions, cannot be trans cannot go, go through this aquaporin. It's just water. Okay. And this is because of these two these these amino acids. So it's made of six transmembrane alpha helices. And so an interesting question that professor who posed in class was, what does the hydropathy plot, plot look like uh, for aquaporin? And so uh, without drawing that out, it just takes too much time, it would be, you would see six spikes uh, because there, that means that there has to be six hydrophobic uh, like sequences of amino acids, like, right? So that, that, because there's a, it's going through the membrane uh, six times, right? Six transmembrane alpha helices. Uh, and so let's talk about let's talk about the structure of aquaporin. So you know you got these you know amino acids, uh, valine, phenylalanine, leucine, you know all that stuff. And then you have these two uh, asparagine residues in orange. And so think of these as you're looking uh, at aquaporin from the top. So these asparagine residues are closer to the top. Uh, like one of them is, is closer to the top than the other one. We'll say so. We'll say maybe this one is closer. And so this is, let's see what's happening here on a molecular level. So this is asparagine in orange, right? And so what's happening is, so remember, it's selected for water. So it's actually going to, this, this side chain right here, this NH2, it kind of resembles water, right? It looks like, you know, there's NH, NH, and then here water is O, and then there's H and H, right? So this is going to hydrogen bond with, uh, with water. And so water is in this, you know, hydrogen bonding network that are constantly you know, forming, reforming hydrogen bonds with other neighboring water molecules. And so this water is gonna kind of, is gonna form hydrogen bonds with this side chain, thinking that, oh, this is just like another water in that hydrogen bonding network, another water molecule. So this, as, as, the first asparagine residue, the one closer to the top, uh, is, is literally catfishing this water molecule. It's literally like, it's hijacking this, this water through hydrogen bond formation. And so then, you know, this hydrogen bond is really just, you know, kind of interested in this, in this asparagine residue. And so then what happens is there's another asparagine residue, you know, slightly uh, below the, the top one, right? And so then this asparagine residue uh, is going to also kind of hydrogen bond to that same water molecule. Like the water molecule thinks like, oh, your friend is kind of cute too, right? So the water molecule is going to bind to the second asparagine residue. Uh, it's got a hydrogen bond. And then before you know it, it's kind of, it's already, now it's going to be deeper into uh, the channel, right? And so now this is where it, uh, it, it, there's a slight problem, or I guess it's a good thing. So it finds itself deeper into the channel, and deeper into the channel, you have a hydrophobic region. So these are all hydrophobic amino acids, you know, phenylalanine, leucine, valine, these are all, you know, hydro hydrophobic, right? Hydrophobic amino acids. So 
Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be here. It cannot go back. Okay, it can't go back. It's already it's in way too deep. Before it realizes that it's been it's been catfished by the two asparagine residues, it's too late for it to go back. So uh, what it does is it'll just shoot through the channel very quickly because it just does not like water. Uh, it is not. It's very hydrophilic. Well, that water wants to be with with water. It doesn't want to be in this non-polar hydrophobic region, right? And so it's just going to shoot through the channel very quickly uh, to get to the other side uh, of the the membrane. And so that's why aquaporin is very very selective uh, for water. So we're going to talk about bacterium uh, potassium channel. And so this is hard to see. There's like that spot again. So this says. It's a type of passive transporter, uh, and then it's over 10,000 times more selective uh, for potassium than sodium, okay? And so this is pretty important. So this, uh, it's highly selective for, for potassium, and uh, you know, there's this potassium ion right here, and then it's surrounded by uh, the structure of this, of this channel. And at the ends of the, these points that are pointing towards the potassium ion are oxygens from the amine group. So these point towards potassium, oxygen is partially negative in that carbonyl form, right? So it wants to be closer to this potassium ion. And so that's why it will orient itself towards the potassium and it creates a really snug fit. Like just potassium is just the perfect size, uh, you know, then it's just super tight fit, it's very happy. Uh, so why is the, why is a, here's a question to think about. So why is sodium not a tight fit? And the answer is that sodium is smaller than potassium. And so think about this, right? So it's smaller than potassium. So if you have a sodium ion right here, it's not gonna be a snug of a fit. It's gonna be like, maybe like this size or something, right? And so then it's not gonna be, uh, it's not gonna have a very tight fit and uh, will not be very selective for sodium. So that's why it's just, it just loves uh, potassium. It's just the perfect fit for potassium. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, some terminology here. So carriers versus channels. Channels are always open, and they're only limited by the concentration gradient, okay? They're only limited by the concentration gradient. Let's write that. Concentration gradient, okay? And then, carriers are not always open, and their rate depends on not the, the concentration gradient, so I'll write gradient in the brackets, that means concentration gradient, and the available uh, carriers, yeah, carriers. So, uh, and then another another thing to note is they're only open uh, to one side of the membrane uh, at one time. Okay, and so let's use so an example how how this would work. Just very simple, like the, just the simple mechanism is so. Let's say a molecule binds, and then it triggers a conformational change. It's a conformational change, conformational change in the carrier in the carrier. And then it changes its structure, so then it can you know transport the molecule into the cell, and that's how base that's how basically carrier works. And so we can talk about uh, how this uh, this works in a specific example of voltage gated uh, potassium carriers. Okay, sometimes I think the word uh, channels is used here, but technically it's carriers, as I think Prof Professor Wu mentioned that. Uh, so. Here you can see this is the structure of a voltage-gated potassium carrier, and uh, this is what's called this orange part right here, uh, extending off. This is the voltage-sensing alpha helix, and this is key to how uh, this is uh, selected, or how, how exactly like this is like this opens and closes, allowing molecules to enter. And so this is the the voltage-sensing alpha helix can be easily protonated or deprotonated depending on the voltage around the membrane. So the voltage is what determines. Uh, whether it's protonated or deprotonated. So let's say you know it's it's protonated and then it's uh, the arm is up like this. Think of it as like a, as like a gate, right? The voltage gated. So the gate is up, but then let's say it's deprotonated and then it changes shape, the conformational change, and it, the, the the gate swings down and then it allows molecules to enter. So that's just and that's dependent entirely on the voltage, right? And that's because of this voltage sensing alpha helix. So we're going to talk about uh, neurons as an example, and, and you know what we just discussed: voltage-sensitive potassium carriers. Uh, so just real quick, we'll talk about the neuron and like a little bit in much more detail and the sodium potassium pump. But uh, just for right now, just a quick, you know, how like an action potential is triggered. So first step: a stimulus will cause the uh, sodium channels to open, and sodium will go in 
and uh, sodium enters, which depolarizes uh, the neuron, and this uh, also opens voltage-sensitive uh, potassium carriers. Okay, so it's negative 70 millivolts. Uh, now it's uh, it's positive 50 millivolts, uh, and then uh, potassium now will rush out because these voltage-sensitive potassium carriers are open, and so this will repolarize uh, the membrane potential. And uh, yeah, potassium rushes out, and the membrane potential is back to you know what it was negative 70 millivolts. That's just that's a very quick uh, overview. Um, very general, and so now we can talk about um, active transporters and some more terminology with this. So, uh, active transporters, the main, the main goal of uh, active transporters, they're responsible for restoring the concentration gradient, okay, and that's very important for a lot of, you know, biological functions in your body. So, the first type is a primary active transporter. Uh, primary active transport, and uh, this is uh, directly using energy. So that's just directly using ATP or light or some kind of redox reaction uh, to get energy to you know transport whatever it needs to transport. And then uh, there's the secondary active transport, and this is not directly using uh, energy, and uh, it uses an existing concentration gradient to transport to in order to transport whatever it is that needs to get across the membrane. And so an example of this would be, let's say, lactose, so lactose transporter. So this uptakes lactose, this brings lactose into the cell against the concentration gradient of lactose by coupling it with a favorable uh, hydrogen ion concentration gradient. Okay, so what, is that, what exactly does that mean? So let's say outside the cell, this is, you know, you have your membrane here and you have this lactose transporter, this, you know, this big transporter protein right there. So outside the cell, you have a low, let's say you have um, low lactose concentration. You want, to bring, you want to bring lactose into the cell against its gradient. So how can you do that? Well, let's say outside the cell, you know you have a high hydrogen ion concentration. So you can, you know, hydrogen ions that will, will, will be transported across uh, its concentration gradient. And so then you can literally just couple that transport with lactose. And so then uh, it's... This lactose transport is coupled with the favorable uh, hydrogen ion transport, and then you can bring lactose into the cell. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about uh, sodium potassium pump, or you, you can see it called sodium potassium ATPase. Uh, it is a primary active transporter, that's what this says up here. I don't know if uh, you can see this on camera. And then uh, it uh, uses one ATP uh, to export uh, three so, uh, sodium ions and import two potassium ions into the cell. So uh, let's let's just go through this mechanism. Let's just start with the first step. So three sodium ions are going to bind uh, to this ATPase. So that's the first step. Pretty simple. So now you have these three sodium ions bind, bound to in the in the in the ATPase, and then ATP is going to bind. Okay. So now ATP is coming into the picture right here. And then you have ATP kind of, you know, on the inside of the cell. This is the outside of the cell, this is the inside. And you have you're still your three sodium ions. Uh, and then the next step is going to be the phosphate from ATP, right? Because ATP adenosine triphosphate is three phosphate groups. So one of the phosphates uh, is going to attach to an aspartate side chain. And, uh, and that's going to, you're going to be left with ADP, right? So that's ATP minus phosphate, you're left with ADP, ADP is going to leave. Uh, it's gone forever, and uh, you're left with a phosphate attached to the ATPase on the inside. And the three sodium is still gone, they're chilling, nothing, nothing's happening. So then the next step is going to be uh, a conformational change uh, after this phosphate group binds, and that, that's going to expose these sodium binding sites to the outside of the cell, so it's going to change the, uh, the con conformation of the uh, primary active transporter, ATPase, and uh, three sodium are gonna leave. So that's what's happening in this step. So you still have this phosphate group attached um, that triggers the conformational change. Three sodium ions are gonna leave, okay? So now, you know, it's, uh, this ATPase is kinda open. And so, oh wait, there's, you know, there's a high concentration of potassium outside, uh, let's say, outside the cell, right? Uh, let's say, or technically not, but let's just say for the sake of this, you're trying to restore the membrane potential, so there's some potassium outside the cell that exists outside the cell. So you want to get two potassium um, into, into the cell, and so two potassium ions are going to bind to the ATPase, the phosphate group is still there. And then the sixth step 
is the, remember the phosphate group is attached to the aspartate, aspartate side chain. It's going to be hydrolyzed and this phosphate group is going to be released. Okay. And so, you know, whenever we, we're doing, we're dealing with phosphate groups, it's, it's going to change, it's going to trigger a conformational change. So, you know, like attaching this phosphate group here caused the conformational change for the sodium ions to leave. And so now we're going to hydrolyze this phosphate group. It's going to leave. And so when this phosphate group is when it, when it, when it leaves, it's going to trigger another conformational change and it's going to expose the potassium the, there's two, these are two potassium ions right here. It's going to expose these sites, these binding sites to the inside of the cell because of the conformational change and the potassium ions are just going to leave and go into the cell. And so that's it. That's the whole pathway. And um, one very important thing, just like, like a big picture kind of question is, well, what is the goal? What is the goal of this, you know, sodium potassium? Why is it so important? And so the goal is to restore the concentration gradient for the next round of uh, a stimulus to, to occur so that an action potential can be, you know, propagated again. So that is the purpose of sodium potassium pumps. And just remember one ATP exports three sodium and imports two potassium. I think one thing was like Nokia or something. Let's see, like it's like uh, potassium out uh, and then, or no, sodium out, potassium in, and then ATP, one ATP. And that's a nice mnemonic, but yeah. Okay, so we're gonna talk about glucose transport. And so this is the intestinal space and this is the inside of an intestinal cell. So what's happening here is uh, glucose transport is coupled with sodium, similar to what we've seen before in previous examples. So uh, sodium is energetically favorable to transport into the cell and that's done through a sodium uh, glucose transporter. And so then glucose is just coupled with this and glucose transport is unfavorable, but then you couple it with a favorable transport of sodium, then glucose gets into the cell. And so then glucose, once it's in the cell, now it's actually energetically uh, favorable to be transported outside of the cell via what's called a glucose transporter, you know, very self-explanatory, and it goes into the blood vessel, uh, so you can get you know, glucose in your blood, blood all uh, throughout your body, right? And then uh, sodium, sodium will be uh, energetically unfavorable to be pumped out and then potassium is going to be also energetically unfavorable to, to pump back in and that's done through a sodium potassium ATPase which we previously you know, discussed. So uh, let's just talk about each of the, there's three transporters here involved and it's kind of important to know like what kind of transporter they are and exactly like what, they, what, they, what they're doing. So, um, Glucose sodium transporter. This is going to be a secondary, a secondary active symporter. So we're at secondary active symporter. Okay, because you know the two molecules are going in the same direction, and uh, it's not directly using energy. There's no ATP involved. Uh, now we're getting into uh, the glucose transporter, and so this is uh, a passive transporter. Okay, this is passive, passive. Transporter, and um, basically, you're using uh, the concentration of glucose is is high uh, outside, and then glucose concentration is low inside. Uh, along glucose concentration, because high glucose inside the cell. Now scratch that. Glucose concentration is high inside the cell. Never mind. Uh, and then sodium and potassium ATP ACE which we already talked about in great detail, uh, that's going to be a primary active antiporter, right? So uh, it's, it's pumping two different substrates uh, in opposite directions, antiporter. Um, and then uh, just a quick note of like what's going on here. So glucose, is trans glucose transport is coupled with the favorable uh, sodium transport into the cell. And now there's a, there's a problem. So now you're getting more and more of sodium inside the cell and that is kind of getting rid of the concentration gradient because what was initially driving the sodium to go into the cell was concentration gradient, right? And so now if you don't have a concentration gradient anymore and you're getting high sodium inside the cell, that's, that's kind of a problem because then you won't, you know, there won't be a driving force to get more sodium in, right? So what's gonna happen, that's why you need this ATPase Right, that's because that pump is going to restore some sodium to go back out. Right, it's going to pump actively pump sodium out, uh, so, so it can restore the concentration gradient. And once the concentration gradient is is you know restored, you can keep pumping glucose in. 
So as long as that sodium concentration gradient is there, glucose transport can glucose can be continuously transported into this intestinal cell. So that is a very uh, just an important no a thing to know. So let's talk about thermodynamics real quick. So uh, thermodynamics, uh, the first uh, quantity you need to know uh, is enthalpy, uh, denoted as H, and so that is the heat released or absorbed for a reaction. And it is also uh, what's called a state function. And a state function uh, only depends on the initial concentrate, on the initial and final state, and it's, so it's path uh, independent. Okay. And so if you look at an example of glucose being, you know, broken down. Uh, the amount of heat released or absorbed will be the same whether, you know, if it's a combustion reaction or if it's a, a biochemical reaction in your body, it doesn't matter, it's going to be the same, that's why it's a state function. So, um, and then we, talk, we can talk about entropy real quick, so entropy is a measure of disorder, um, it increases as uh, temperature increases and an important thing to note is the entropy of the universe is uh, always increasing. And. Uh, uh, there's also what we previously discussed a little bit of a re review is the hydrophobic effect and so that there is a net gain of entropy in this protein folding process right that's what we learned because uh, the entropy of a nonpolar molecule will decrease uh, but the entropy of the surrounding water molecules is going to increase when these water cages are formed uh, so then that's what gives you that net gain of entropy and that drives you know that's protein that drives protein folding right uh, just, that's just review and so now we can talk about you know, reaction uh, spontaneity real quick. So we have this general reaction scheme right here. And uh, this uh, delta G value is equal to the delta G standard plus RT natural log of the concentration of products over reactants. And so this delta G standard uh, is, uh, indicates that all reactants and products are each at one molar. And that's, like the, sta that's the standard state. R is uh, 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin, and T times natural log of, of you know this whole quantity right here. And so you can also uh, let's say if changing if delta G is equal to zero, which we'll talk about up here, that, that means it's at equilibrium. Okay. So if it's at equilibrium, then we can you know we plug in zero here, and then we can rewrite this equation to give us this. So that's delta G standard is equal to negative R T natural log K. And this is, uh, this is not very common because this uh, is, is saying that the reaction is at, at standard state and that's never like really the case in nature. Uh, but yeah, there, this equation does exist. Um, yeah, maybe but that, that's all I need to know. Um, and then so now we can talk about probably the most important equation and uh, I would say my favorite equation because I think it's the easiest to understand. And that this is delta G equals the change in entropy minus the temperature times the change in entropy. So uh, this can predict the spontaneity of, your rea of a reaction. So if you have uh, delta, if for an exergonic reaction, that means it's spontaneous. Delta G is going to be less than zero. And then for an endergonic reaction, delta G is going to be greater than zero. And this is going to be non-spontaneous. Non-spontaneous in the forward direction, spontaneous in the forward direction. Um, and then, of course, we talked about, uh, we kind of hinted that here, if delta G is equal to zero, then that means it is at, uh, the reaction is at equilibrium. Um, and now we can talk about, uh, briefly, real quick, about ATP. So ATP is a high energy compound, right? And that's kind of where we get all our energy to, you know, fuel these unfavorable reactions in our body. So uh, this is the basic structure of ATP, right? There's an adenine, uh, adenine nitrogenous base. And uh, you have these three phosphates, and these these thing, these bonds linking the oxygens to the phosphates. These are called phospho uh, anhydride bonds, and these are very important because they give energy to drive unfavorable uh, reactions. Okay, and so uh, real quick on the side here, I kind of wrote this really small. I just wanted to squeeze this in. So there's you know four things to think about uh, of why it's so like important. Why is it so nice? for ATP to be hydrolyzed, to be broken down, and to you know, get energy from it. So it really likes to be broken down. It's not a very stable compound, right? All these negative charges close together, it's not very stable. So uh, why does ATP love to be hydrolyzed? So the first reason is it will separate these negative charges, right? Because you, know, you don't want to bring you know, three negative charges close together. It's very, very unfavorable. So the second, the second reason would be uh, the products have uh, more resonance, right? Once uh, you, know, you, you break apart 
these uh, phosphate groups, they're able to have um, more resonance stabilization, and so it kind of favors you know breaking apart. And then the third is an increase in entropy because you know if you go from one product to two products, uh, that's in, you know you got more molecules on the product side. That's an increase in entropy, right? Number of molecules, uh, increase entropy. Um, and then the fourth reason is that pro the products are better solvated, so this uh, also increases entropy. And these four reasons are why uh, ATP loves to be hydrolyzed, loves to be broken down, it's very unstable and you know it just gives us so much energy that we can use to you know fuel all of our all the reactions in our body that don't normally occur. Um, yeah. Okay, so bear with me, uh, I know some spots are hard to see but I'll kind of verbally like explain those parts or everything that's written here. So we're gonna talk about coupling uh, delta G when uh, unfavorable reactions, so when delta G is greater than zero, that means it's non-spontaneous endergonic reaction, right? So uh, let's look at this reaction coordinate here. Uh, we got free energy delta G labeled on the y-axis, you have the reaction coordinate labeled on the x-axis. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, in reaction one, you're having glucose plus a phosphate gives you glucose 6-phosphate. I wrote PI uh, as for abbreviation for phosphate. So you have this uh, delta G value that's kind of positive, and that's kind of sad, right? It's not, it's not spontaneous if, it's, if delta G is positive. So then let's look at reaction two. Reaction two is ATP going to ADP plus a phosphate. So this reaction is very, very spontaneous. The delta G is, is negative, right? It's reactants here, products here. It's a very you know, favorable reaction. It proceeds spontaneously in the forward direction. Uh, and now let's, let's think what happens is if we, if we combine reactions one and two, we can link this uh, non-spontaneous with this highly spontaneous uh, reaction, and then we can get a, set, a, a spontaneous reaction, right? So that's glucose plus ATP gives you glucose 6-phosphate plus ADP. And this reaction is net uh, negative, it's delta G uh, is negative, and we'll go over the calculation for that, and uh, it's, gonna be it's gonna be spontaneous now, right? So now we can get a spontaneous, this previously non-spontaneous reaction can now become spontaneous. And so over here, what's written here is, so delta G3 uh, equals delta G1, so that's for the first reaction, plus delta G2, uh, which is the uh, second reaction. And so uh, just thinking about it numerically, so if you, let's say you have a small positive number for delta G1, right, that's because it's greater than uh, zero, and then you have a really, really negative number for delta G2, that's the you know, highly favorable ATP hydrolysis, uh, you're going to have a net negative uh, spontaneous net negative number. So a small positive number uh, plus a really negative really negative number is going to be a net negative number. And then that means that the delta G three for you know this reaction three right here is going to be uh, spontaneous, right? And so you can look at that num numerically with actual values. So if you look at the delta G standard uh, state values for each of the reactions, reaction one is plus thirteen point eight kilojoules per mole. Uh, reaction two is uh, negative 30.5, so it's uh, much like greater in like the, the the magnitude is greater, but it's it's negative, and so then that gives you a net negative uh, negative 16.7 kilojoules per mole, and so that is now a spontaneous reaction, and that is how you couple uh, delta G uh, when reactions where delta G is greater than zero. Last one, it's the last one, it's the last one. So now let's do uh, an overview of metabolism, okay? So uh, anabolism is the building up process. So this is making large macromolecules from you know, smaller building blocks. And catabolism is the opposite, that's the breaking down part. So that's using, that's starting with large macromolecules and breaking them in to small building blocks. So now we have glycolysis, okay? So glycolysis is basically starting with glucose and you make two pyruvates, so that's two three carbon molecules. And there's about 10 steps to this. And then uh, there's the opposite and that's gluconeogenesis. And that is two pyruvate going to glucose. Okay, so two three carbon molecules going to one six carbon molecule, that's glucose. So, uh, something interesting that Professor Wu talked about in class is, so let's say you have a sufficient amount of glucose in your blood, 
So then, you know, glycolysis is going to be preferred because you have this, you have the reactant glucose in your blood. You can easily, you know, convert it to 2 pyruvate and do the glycolysis pathway, right? But let's say you are starving, okay, and you've used up all the glycogen stored in your liver, and that supply could last like 24 hours, apparently, less than 24 hours, right? So the liver is actually, uh, goes backwards uh, in order to make glucose. And so um, then that's when you start with pyruvate to make glucose, and then it transports this glucose uh, into the blood so that it can get to your brain because your brain has to, you know, always be functioning. It can, fuck, shoot, god damn it. I'm not drunk, I'm just tired. Um, and uh, yeah. So yeah, that is why, uh, you know, sometimes you do need to do gluconeogenesis if you're starving, and this can keep you alive uh, up to seven days without food. I think it's actually maybe three weeks without food. Uh, I don't know, I don't give a shit. Okay, uh, then you have the citric acid cycle, and this is going from pyruvates uh, making carbon dioxide, and the energy uh, in this, during this process is still stored in NADH and QH2, and these are electron carriers. And these are important for the next step, which is ETC, that's the electron transport chain. And electrons are transferred from uh, the electron carriers until oxygen, O2, because that's the final electron acceptor in the ETC, uh, until oxygen receives these electrons. This generates a proton gradient, and this proton gradient is used to make ATP. And that is why biochemistry is amazing. And I'm done.